Welcome back everybody. This is Eric and Chad here, Direct Veteran 8888. And today we have another five guns video for you. Today we're going to be talking about five odd, weird, obscure firearms you probably don't know even exist. So we're, we're kind of going over some oddballs here. Okay, that's what this whole video is about. And we've actually gotten some requests from people to kind of cover some of the weirder guns out there. Some of the stuff you don't really see every day. Some of the guns that have really odd characteristics about them and things like that. So we're going to go over a couple here. We're going to start off with um, a pistol here that we've actually done a video before uh, on. This is the Steyr Hammer. This is a model 1918 Steyr Hahn, also known as a Steyr Hammer. Uh, if you care to check it out, we've done a full review on this gun. Uh, but it's a very odd pistol that's stripper clip fed. It does not have a removable magazine, but the, the rounds do feed from a magazine that is integral into the grip of the, of the pistol itself. It's loaded by locking the slide to the rear, applying the safety to physically lock the slide. Now, I'm not going to load it right here in the building, but you have eight rounds of 9mm Steyr. Okay, so this is not a 9mm Luger or 9mm Parabellum as we would know it. It's 9mm Steyr, so it's kind of somewhere in between like 38 Super and 9mm in terms of uh, pressures and speeds and things like that. Uh, but at its time and in its day, it was considered a pretty dang powerful handgun. Well, no doubt. I mean, before that, really, like you had kind of the broom handle. You know, it was a clipper strip fed, semi-automatic pistol, So, and that was a 30 Mauser. Correct. So, yeah. you know, the, the Mauser broom handle is definitely an odd gun. Uh, but this one, in my mind, is probably a little more odd because when you think a stripper clip fed handgun, you usually think of the Mauser broom handle because they were produced in such you know higher numbers mm -hmm. uh, than the Steyr was. But you know, it's just one of those really odd gun designs that you just don't see every day, and that's definitely one that is a weird one on the list and fires a nine millimeter Steyr. Uh, again, we do have a full review on that gun if you want to see it in action. Um, another gun moving down the line, this is a really, really odd pistol here that not a lot of people know about. It's a Spanish service pistol known as the Astra Model 400. Uh, it's a blowback gun. It fires a 9mm Largo, which again is another weird 9mm cartridge that not a lot of people really know about. And I actually do have a box of original military ammunition right here uh, for the gun. And you can see by looking at it, that again, just like the Steyr, it's a very, very odd little cartridge. It's, uh, you know, kind of a longer length 9mm. So imagine Largo literally means long. It is an elongated 9mm type cartridge and very similar velocities to what you would kind of expect. And it's a really interesting gun. The Astra Model 400 was a gun that went into service in the early 1920s in Spain and remained in service until it was replaced by the Model A. Uh, which is kind of like a 1911 mm -hmm. uh, in 1946, 47 or so. So it was. This gun was in service for about 25 years, and it's known as a Model uh, 400. It's a blowback gun, so it's a very, very odd type of pistol. There's no lock breech mechanism uh, for this particular gun. It's blowback only. It has a very stout and deliberate mainspring on it that's very strong, and it's meant to be a simple service pistol that was meant to be features wise very similar to like Colt 1911s, Lugers, you know the guns that were in service at the time around the world the Spanish wanted a service pistol that could relatively compete with other service pistols uh, of the era. They also had a, a little carbine that was based on loosely on the Mauser 93 called a Spanish Destroyer uh. that took the same type of magazines. So you have 9mm Largo feeding from this little magazine here you could take this magazine out of the uh, Model 400 pistol, put it into a destroyer carbine, and a policeman or someone like that could extend the range of the 9mm Largo by a couple of hundred yards with a rifle instead of handgun. One thing odd about that gun I've never really been a huge fan of is the weird grip angle. It's like a very vertical grip. Yep. I found it to be somewhat uncomfortable to fire, but the guns are fun to shoot. Well, the grip know. angle on the uh, the Steyr is odd, too. It is. It's real vertical. Yeah, yeah. It, the, the, the grip angle on the Steyr reminds you a lot of like the early 1911s where they're very, very vertical mm -hmm. instead of that improved grip angle that you would expect on the uh, 1911. Uh, it does have a bit of an angle to it, but not that perfect angle that you get on the later 1911s. So, moving down the line, number three, Chad. <laughs> 
This is a really neat gun. This is like a Walther P38, but it's it's not a K version because the K versions actually had um, a slightly longer barrel, uh, shorter than a standard P38, but not quite so stubby as this. And you know, we uh, we were just stopping by a little shop on the way to Florida one time, and Eric found this gun in there, and we were eyeballing it, and he wound up picking it up, and. Uh, Oddly enough, I was reading a, uh, a book by Alan C. Paulson on silencer history and technology, and I was flipping through, and there was a section about early pistol suppressors, and there was a Walther similar to this one that had a big old long finish made 9mm suppressor you know, on it. And I just found it really odd that we came across this right after you know, yeah. I'm flipping through this book. And uh, that is just an odd thing. The story is it might be like a, a special like detective's model, like a real uh, concealable, compact you know, handgun that a detective would have carried back in the day. Well, you know, the weird thing about these guns is that they are a true military slash arsenal conversion. It's not just something that some gunsmith hacked up. Mm -mm. From every uh, bit of information that I can find on this particular gun is that it's a P1 or P38 uh, that was cut down in around the late to mid-70s. Uh, so around that time frame, you know, these guns were kind of being phased out. So I would imagine that if they had a bunch of these laying around, they would thought, hey, well, how can we make this uh, more useful? Maybe they had detectives or undercover cops or people like that, or maybe even like operatives mm -hmm. that wanted a gun that was very concealable but still semi-automatic. Uh, you get all the features of the P38, but without all the extra length of the barrel. Mm -hmm. And they relocated the, the sight exactly. itself to the actual frame, or not the frame, but the, the slide. slide. Yeah, because on the standard guns, you know, the front sight is actually on the end of the barrel, but with this being such a little short, stubby, compact barrel, they had to relocate the sight to the slide so it would fit. Well, over the years, I'll tell you, in terms of, of, of just uncommon factor and rarity, That's I've, an seen, odd one. I've seen quite a few of the Ks, uh, and they are desirable guns. The mm -hmm. Ks are awesome. They'll be marked K. It'll say like P38 or P1 mm -hmm. K for Kerr's Short. Okay, well, I guess that is short. a P1, not a P38. So. Right, right. But that that's okay. It does have P38 grips. Yep. But this is an interesting gun. This this very well could have just been one of those things where they had a bunch of parts in the bin, and a couple of guys at the armory decided to have some fun and, and make some shorties. Whether or not they had any real use to them, it could be speculated probably, but definitely a gun you don't see every day. And in the world of P38s <laughs> and P1s, I, I've only seen one, and it's the one I own. Yep. Okay, so that's kind of one of those things there. So Getting into some odd rifles. Yeah. So, like, this is one. We were stopping by a little shop up in North Georgia, and uh, we were poking around, and Eric saw this on the rack, and we were both like, what in the world? So we picked the gun up, and then... what? What's that? What's that for? Wait a minute. Oh! Open bolt. Open bolt 22 semi-automatic. Uh, this is a Voer. Probably going to get... Um, you know, hated on for that pronunciation, but Voer uh, model 2005, and this is a kind of like an early 80s firearm. Uh, it's 22 that fires from the open bolt position. After you know 86 and the whole Hughes Amendment and everything, they pretty much like started to outlaw the production of open bolt semi-automatics. Um, there are some of these guns, to my knowledge, that were. Uh, converted into machine guns. I think the, Fleming did that, a lot yeah, of those conversions. Fleming did a lot of conversions on a bunch of different guns, but uh, they fire from, this is a 15 shot mag, and these are very, very hard to find, and not only that, but expensive as well. And uh, Eric just decided to you know, pick that little guy up, and it's really a neat gun. It shoots really, really good. It, it, for an open bolt uh, rifle, it's actually quite accurate. It's got kind of like Mauser style sights, mm -hmm. which is something I like. It is German made, you know, so it's kind of- front sight. I mean, reminds me a lot of like just a nice CZ you know, variant. It is, it is. It's, it's very odd. The stock is a little cheap, yeah, yeah. Um, but other than that, the gun seems to hold up just fine. But this is definitely the kind of gun that you don't see every day. This fits into the oddball gun. You know, it, it's not often that you find an open bolt semi just laying around anymore. A few of them that come to mind are like some of the M11s that were produced mm. uh, in an open bolt semi configuration, which for all intents and purposes and legality's sake actually are machine guns. They just have a really crude disconnector system in them that actually is prone to breakage. And I've, I've known of guys that have had like open bolt semi-automatic uh, Mac 11s and went out to shoot them and then the things break and go full auto. I think that's really where you get a lot of this misconception from people where they say, oh, if you just file this down, it makes the gun full auto. Well, no, it's a little bit more than that. But that's one of the instances where that actually is kind of true.
Okay, mm, it's of. one of the very few instances where if one of those parts in there breaks, you can get a runaway gun. And the ATF kind of frowned upon the open bolt semis, but in terms of open bolt semi-automatic 22s, mm. this is literally the only one I even know exists at all. And that makes it odd and rare and extremely obscure and it fits perfect <laughs> into this video. I so. remember we, uh, we called Ray and was asking about it. He's like, you found one of those? I hate you. Yep. <laughs> All right, so let's, let's take a, a, a direction in a different rabbit hole here. Here, you tell them a story about this. It's pretty special. Okay, so uh, this is a model 755 Sahara and it's H and R. It's kind of an older firearm. Harrison Richardson for yep. those, of, uh, those of you who do not like acronyms. Exactly. So, um, you know, it's kind of a man liquor style sock. It's man liquor. Man liquor. Man All right, and it's got the, you know, kind of Mauser style sights. <laughs> and uh, on first uh, glance, it's kind of unassuming looking. It's kind of got the small, somewhat you've stocked to it. Uh, safety, you know, seems pretty, pretty cut and dry. Well, it's a single shot rifle, but, okay, you load the round in the chamber, you close the bolt, you shoot it, bang. It blows to the rear and knocks the casing out and then stays to the rear. Mm -hmm. So it's basically like a semi-auto, but you without a magazine <laughs> and it doesn't return and it doesn't feed the round. So literally, I, I know that's kind of hard to grasp for some of you, so load the round, close the bolt. All it does is move back and forth, like that. That's it, it doesn't lock, it doesn't turn. Pull it to the rear, load the cartridge, close it, shoot it, when you shoot it, bang, it blows to the rear. There's like a little buffer back here that it slams against, it throws the cartridge out, and I guess you load another one, close it, and keep shooting. So it's actually a very fun little rifle to shoot. Well, what's funny is like the gun show that he picked this up at, you know, oh, with the gun show loophole. Oh, oh no. Um, you know, he was buying another firearm, and the old fellow that had this on the table, he, you know, he had no interest in it. Like, no one had any interest in this gun until, like, we came over there, and we were, like, looking at it and stuff. And, you know, he said, man, I'll tell you what, you like that gun? Just buy this one and you can have it, mm -hmm. pretty much. I mean, so just a little cheap 22. That's it's just obscure. And it's obscure and it's odd. Yep, and he's and, obscure and odd, so he loves this kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So with, with these types of guns, I mean, if I'm ever out and about at a show or wherever, and I happen to come across them, or I'm in a gun store, I like oddball stuff like mm -hmm. that. That's weird. And everything on this table, actually, every gun on this table, except for that pre model eight down there, we're going to talk about in a minute. Mm -hmm are guns that I just went by a gun shop and thought, wow, that's really odd. I've never seen something like that. So you know what? I'm going to buy it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, sometimes a gun purchase doesn't have to be justified. It doesn't have to make sense. Sometimes it can just be because it's awesome mm -hmm. and it's weird and you, you just, just like, like odd stuff. Yeah. And that is really, in my opinion, in terms of the guns that I own and everything, these are the ones that for me personally as a collector, mean the most to me in terms of cool factor and history and a little bit of nostalgia and kind of an odd story behind them. All of these guns have a little story and in my opinion that makes them a little bit more special and unique than just some of the other kind of things that are out there. So speaking of unique, yeah, here's I mean, our, here's our, our uh, wild card. card. So this is not so much a really obscure gun or anything like that but it does kind of have a strange operating system. It's got a, it, this is a Pre-model eight, so this is a Remington-produced firearm that was designed after uh, John Browning's design uh, that was purchased from FN by Remington, and they started making the pre-model eights. Then in 1908, this is a 1907 model gun, so this is a semi-automatic 35 Remington from 1907. So this design is um, pretty much one of the first commercially viable semi-auto, like sporting type rifles that was ever produced and it follows the same kind of like long recoil action of the uh, Browning A5. Um, if you guys are familiar with that, the, the barrel assembly and all slides to the rear with the bolt and then slams back home, picks up a new shell and then slams home. The same idea goes with this gun. The barrel rides in this shroud here and it's got a big long recoil spring assembly and it slams back, ejects the case, loads a new round and then it slams back home. Uh, very interesting, very smooth cycling gun. I've just always really been interested in these firearms. There was a, um, a police supply that would uh, integrate 15 and 20 shot magazines into these guns. I think there may have been some other capacities available too. Um, but uh, Frank Hamer, uh, one of the guys, he was a, a Texas Ranger, I guess. And you know they got together and they ambushed Bonnie and Clyde. And they used everything from bars 
to a Model 8 uh, that had, you know, this police supply magazine on there, and they uh, tore the crap out of Bonnie and Clyde. But this is one of the first, uh, like, designated marksman rifles or, like, sniper rifles that was ever put into place in the FBI, which is pretty interesting. I think it was the 81 that was put into place there because those came around in the mid-30s. They only made this style of gun until, like, the early 50s. There were so. definitely some events that transpired that made not only law enforcement, but namely some of the more specialized uh, agencies like the FBI realize that they needed some form of a rifle uh, that they could shoot back at a potential sniper type arrangement mm -hmm. or something like that. And I, I don't remember exactly which event it was, but there oh, it was I, the 33 uh, Kansas City massacre. That's right. I think. There, there, were, there was one it of was these. It was right after 33. There was one of these shootings where the FBI finally decided, you know, we really need to have some type of designated marksman or someone in our in our squad of guys with a precision rifle with a lot of power that can punch out and and hit a target at longer range. Mm. They realized that their program was lacking a little bit when it came to, dare I say, sniper. I mean, military sniper rifles were around and everything, but. But they just weren't really as common, and it almost just wasn't one of those things where the police thought, oh, we don't need that. They wanted something a little bit handier, mm -hmm. and, and comparing, like, let's just say an 03 yep. or something like uh, that we would have been using as some form of sniper rifle at the time, like a Warren Swayze or something, that, that's not real practical for a cop to carry around on a raid or something like that. But this that nice rifle and lightweight and handy. is light and handy, it's semi-automatic, has fast follow-up shots, fires a reasonably powerful cartridge, Combine that with the higher capacity magazine, and you got kind of a winner for uh, that type of thing. So yeah. it was really interesting. That was really one of the first type of long-range rifles that was adopted in any co official capacity by the FBI and other law enforcement yeah, agencies. Yeah, I think uh, some of the FBI models of the '81. I want to say that they. Um, I want to say that some of them had like Lyman uh, peep sights integrated into the rear of the receiver. They had some different front side arrangements. I think they were just plain blades. Uh, there's a few different variations of that, but this rifle too, a lot of people don't realize, is a takedown. So you pop the forearm off and then rotate this lever around, as you've seen in other videos that we've done, pull the entire barrel assembly off with the bolt to the rear, and then you've got a nice compact package to store, or transport, or whatever the case is. So Definitely an odd gun. It is. So uh, expect it's, a full review on that. Especially for its time. Uh, we, exactly. Yeah. Especially for its time. We haven't done a full review on that gun yet, but we will. Uh, guys, thanks for watching today's video. I know that uh, we always have to choose a wild card, so that's a definitely an interesting wild card there. Hopefully you uh, discovered some guns you didn't know existed, or maybe you've never even seen any of these before. That's what the premise of this video was meant to be, mm -hmm. is to show some really crazy stuff that maybe people don't know exists. So uh, thanks for watching. We hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you sign up for our email list. Guys, we have a whole lot of stuff going on, and it's a great way for us to be able to stay in touch with you and make sure you don't miss anything from video announcements when videos come out. Sometimes we'll send out an email letting people know that you know video has dropped. Uh, also, we send out a newsletter about every other week or so that's um, all kind of neat stuff, everything from just stuff uh, behind the scenes that's going on with the channel uh, all the way down to uh, little articles that we write about prepping and little things like that, gunsmithing hacks. Mm -hmm. So if you like that kind of thing, make sure you sign up for our email list so you can stay informed on what's going on and maybe get a little bit of extra content in the uh, you know, in the process that doesn't cost you anything. It's free, so might as well sign up for it and uh, so we can stay in touch with you. But Thank you so much for watching today's video. We have many more on the way. We'll catch you next time. See you guys.